Okay, so welcome back to this video in which we are discussing uh, the mechanism of action of uh, mitomycin C. Okay, now I just realised that I haven't completely finished this structure because it should have had an alcohol group there. So, this is the structure we've now got to in our, um, in our pathway for mitomycin C. Now what's going to happen is the DNA is going to come into play. So let's just have a brief reminder of the structure of DNA. Okay, so DNA consists of nucleotides, a sterified, well, it's not a sterified together, linked together. So let me remind you of the structure of a nucleotide. A nucleotide consists of three main parts. It consists of a sugar, which is deoxyribose. So this is this pentamer with this carbon sticking off up here. So I'll colour the sugar in blue. So this is the sugar, which is deoxyribose, specifically 2-deoxyribose. Okay. It then has this phosphate group up here, and together these are going to make the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA. And then attached to the deoxyribose sugar, you then have an organic base. So there are four organic bases used in DNA, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. So let's say this is a guanine organic base. Okay, so this is one nucleotide. It's a guanine nucleotide. Now, this will be linked to another nucleotide below. The phosphate group of the nucleotide below will bind via a phosphoester link to the third carbon's hydroxyl group of the deoxyribose of the nucleotide above it. Okay, so here is the next nucleotide along in the DNA. So here's another uh, deoxyribose sugar with its phosphate group, and it will again have an organic base. So let's say this is thymine. Okay, right. Now, there will be another strand of DNA, which will be the complementary strand to this one. Okay, so let's put in the complementary organic bases. So the complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine. The complementary organic base to thymine is adenine. Okay, and this will be linked up to the sugar phosphate backbone of this complementary strand. So you'll have another sugar phosphate backbone here, but the difference is it's running in the opposite direction, so I'm going to have to draw this one upside down. So here's the ribose sugar upside down. Here's the fifth carbon. Sorry, not the ribose sugar. I'm guilty. The 2-deoxyribose. Ribose is in DNA, remember. This is D... Uh, sorry, ribose is in RNA, remember. And this is DNA, so we're talking about deoxyribose nucleic acid. Okay, so... Again, here's the next nucleotide along. So here's the next um, deoxyribose sugar, and it will be linked to the phosphate group of uh, the nucleotide below it. Okay, so this arrangement where you have one uh, strand of the DNA running one way and the complementary strand running the other way is what's known as anti-parallel arrangement. Okay, so we say that the two strands of DNA run anti-parallel to one another. Okay, right. So, basically what's going to happen is it is the guanine organic bases which uh, mitomycin C is going to bind to. So let's have a look at the structure of the guanine organic bases so that we can then look at the reaction between uh, the mitomycin C and the guanine organic base. So, the structure of guanine, it's a purine organic base, which means it has two rings, basically, and will continue drawing skeletal structures rather than molecular structures. So, the structure of guanine is that you start off with the first ring, which is a six-membered ring consisting of uh, four carbons and two nitrogens. So here are the one, two, three, four carbons, and then you have these two nitrogens. And the two nitrogens need to have a single carbon in between them, so they need to be spaced like this. And this is what's known as a pyrimidine ring, because you should have alternating double and single bonds. So a pyrimidine ring, a pure pyrimidine ring, is a six-membered ring consisting of carbon and nitrogen, four carbons and two nitrogens, in this exact arrangement we've seen here, where you've got alternating double and single bonds, so you'd need another double bond there. 
Okay, and that would be the pyrimidine ring, or at least the skeletal structure of the pyrimidine ring. However, in guanine, you don't have this double bond here. Instead, you have a carbonyl group up here, and then you have a nitrogen off the hydrogen. In addition, you also have an amino group sticking off here, and this is actually the amino group that the mitomycin C is going to bind to. Now, off this face of the primidine ring, you also have another ring linked off, and this is going to be a five-membered ring, and it's going to be an imidazole ring. So you have two nitrogens, like so, then a double bond to a carbon, and then like so. So it's a five-membered ring consisting of three carbons and two nitrogens. So this is the imidazole ring. Okay, right. Now, the nitrogen here is where you attach this organic base to the ribose of the, uh, of the nucleotide. So this is what's going to be this bond, basically, here. Well, not for a thymine one, but for this guanine one. This bond here is this bond here, basically. So this is how you attach the organic base to uh, the um, ribose sugar. And it's worth noting that this won't be sort of in the same plane as the ribose sugar. So we see the, uh, the um, DNA phospho phosphate sugar phosphate backbone. There we go. Uh, it's running like this. Basically, this structure will be in the plane, which is, um, well, to which the uh, sugar phosphate backbone is perpendicular. So this won't basically be sitting upright next to the ribose sugar. Instead, imagine rotating this around so that it's now a flat molecule, okay, and then sticking it on. That's what it's more like as far as the three-dimensional structure is concerned. Anyway. What's going to happen is that the mitomycin C is going to bind to uh, this uh, nucleotide. So let me draw out the structure of the mitomycin C that we'd got to. So, on the previous page, what we had got to is this stage of the mitomycin C activation. So we still have this six-membered ring here, and we will always have this six-membered ring. And uh, basically, it had a carbonyl group up here and an alcohol group down here. Then it had these amino groups over here, well, this amino group over here, and this methyl group over here, which aren't really going to play any part in this story. Then we have this five-membered ring here, okay, to a nitrogen down here, and we just formed this double bond here. Oh, and by the way, we should add in a double bond here and a double bond here. Then we've got this other five-membered ring down here, got a double bond there, okay, we've no longer got the aziridine ring, and instead we've got this amino group down here, and then we've got the methylene group up here, with this carbamoyl group linked off it up here. Okay, right. So, what's going to happen then? Well, basically, this carbon here is going to bind with this amino group here. Right. So what you're going to do is, if I draw this amino group out in a bit more detail, so that's, how should I draw this? I'll draw it again. So imagine this amino group is like this. So this is this amino group, just drawn in a bit more detail. What we're going to do, basically, is we're going to cleave this bond here, okay? So we're going to cleave one of the bonds between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. What we're also going to do is we're going to cleave this bond here. Now, this will mean when we cleave this bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, you produce a hydrogen atom. So imagine homolytic fission. So imagine that in the bond there are two electrons, and we'll simply imagine, just so that we can keep track, we're not actually going through the mechanisms here. We're I mean, if we were an organic chemist, we could go through, and these, these electrons nucleophilically attack here, etc., etc. We're not doing that. We're just trying to keep track of the electrons. So in order to keep track of the electrons, imagine that in each of these bonds that we're breaking, one of the electrons goes to each compartment partner. Okay, so you'll give one of the electrons back to the nitrogen, one of the electrons to the hydrogen. That's not what is going to happen in actual reality, but we're just trying to keep track of where the electrons are going. We're not actually looking at the electron-by-electron electron mechanism of this. 
Okay, so you can imagine that homolytic bond fission is happening, but of course it's not. Okay, so uh, basically, this nitrogen's now got a free electron. This hydrogen is just a normal hydrogen atom now. We're then going to break this bond here. That means that one of the electrons will go back to this carbon and one to this carbon. So this carbon has now got a free electron. What we will then do is bind this carbon to this nitrogen on the guanine. Okay, so remember, this isn't just an isolated amino group. It's bound to this guanine organic base, which is within the DNA. So that's how we're going to link this up to the DNA. Now, we can't just stop there because this carbon's now got a free electron. So what also is going to happen is this double bond that we have just literally formed is going to cleave. And that means that this now has a free electron and this carbon also has a free electron. So this carbon will use its free electron to bind with this carbon down here's free electron to form a double bond there. But now this carbon has a free electron. So what's going to happen is we're going to again cleave up this carbonyl group up here with one of the bonds of the carbonyl group uh, that we just formed in the previous step. And again, this carbon then is going to form a double bond with this carbon here. So you're going to return the double bond there. Now, finally, that will mean that this oxygen has a free electron, but that combined with the hydrogen from here. So that's what's going to happen in the next step. So, what's going to happen? Here's our mitomycin C molecule here. Okay, so here's this six-membered ring back again, which now has the uh, benzene structure again, the full benzene structure. So you have these alternating double and single bonds. You then have an alcohol group up here. You have the amino group here, the methyl group here, and an alcohol group down here. Okay, then you have this next ring, this next five-membered ring here. Okay, and uh, this now has a double bond that's here rather than here. Okay, so this was the double bond formed by this carbon and this carbon from the free electron that this carbon got from the breaking of this bond and the free electron that this carbon got from the breaking of this bond here. Okay, and then in this five-membered ring down here, you've broken this double bond so that this carbon here can link up to the amino group of the guanine organic base. But before we draw the guanine organic base, let's just finish our mitomycin C molecule by putting in that amino group there, and then the CH2 linked to the carbamic acid group over here. Okay, right. And now let's finish our uh, guanine organic base sitting here. So you'll have your pyrimidine ring here. Oh, and by the way, I didn't think, don't think I actually told you when we were discussing the structure of guanine. When you have a pyrimidine ring like this, whoops, we've missed off that nitrogen. Um, when you have a pyrimidine ring like this, uh, linked to the imidazole ring, then uh, that's known as a purine ring. So this entire structure is called a purine ring, which is why the guanine organic base is known as a purine. Okay, so let's finish this structure by drawing the imidazole ring here. So these two nitrogens, then you've got this double bond between the nitrogen and the carbon. And by the way, uh, we've forgotten to draw the skeletal structure. Never mind, one little blip there. Never mind. Uh, this is the reason this is called an imidazole ring, because this double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, this is what is known as an imi bond. And that's whenever you've got a double bond between a carbon and a nitrogen, it's known as an imi bond. So you've now got this link between a guanine organic base and a mitomycin C molecule. Right, now that's added the mitomycin C onto one guanine organic base. What's going to happen is the next reaction is going to link it onto another guanine organic base. So basically what's going to happen is you're going to bring in another guanine organic base, okay? So imagine another one of these comes in. Again, it's going to attach onto this amino group. So you're going to cleave the bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen on another one of these guanine organic bases. And the other bond that you're going to break on the mitomycin C molecule is this bond here, the bond between the methylene group and the carbamoyl group, okay? So, 
that will give this carbon of the methylene group a free electron and also this oxygen a free electron. This carbon will then bind to the nitrogen on the guanine. So this is then going to be linked to another guanine organic base. And the hydrogen will link to the oxygen to form, so let me just draw this out, to form this molecule. So you'll have the car carbonyl group there, you'll have an alcohol group there, so a carboxylic acid group, and then you'll have this amino group here. And the name of this molecule is carbamic acid. Okay, so this is called carbamic acid. Right, now are we going to have room to draw this entire structure that we've got now here? Okay, well, I suppose we could... No, we're not going to have room. Not unless I just abbreviate the guanine. So, um... Or should I try and draw the entire structure? I don't know if it will actually fit, even if I've got a bigger piece of paper. Um, basically, I think I'll just abbreviate the guanines down. So this, the other guanine that's going to link on here, will be linked in exactly the same way as you've got this one linked here. So imagine just cutting this bond and translocating this up to here. You'll have another one exactly like that. And by the way, we're not just moving this one. This one's stuck. You brought in another one that's doing this. But the link will basically be exactly the same. So let me now just abbreviate the guanine. So the final stage is that you have this mitomycin C molecule here. So let's start with this six-membered ring over here. Okay? Which has these two alcohol groups up here. And then these alternating double and single bonds like so. Then you've got this amino group over here and then the methyl group over here. And then off this you've got this five-membered ring down here which has this nitrogen and then you've got this double bond here then another five-membered ring down here. Okay, This one is linked to this amino group of the guanine organic base Okay, so I'll just then just put a little box with the rest of guanine. And remember, this amino group is part of guanine, so this drawing may be slightly misleading, so I'm showing part of guanine here. Okay, and then you've got the amino group down here. Then you've got this methylene group, which is again going to be linked to the amino group of guanine, and you've got another guanine organic base there. Okay, so basically, this molecule is going to bind to two guanine organic bases. This is how it's going to uh, produce inter- and intra-strand crosslinks. Okay, so, basically, if we draw the two strands of DNA here, so remember, these two strands will be running anti-parallel, then either these two guanine organic bases that you are binding together they could be on different strands, okay? So you could be forming a link between these two guanines on different strands. That would be what's known as an inter-strand crosslink. So this would be an inter-strand crosslink. Or the two guanines that you are linking together in this way, uh, whoops, inter-strand crosslink, they could be on the same strand. So you could have two like this, and then you could be linking them together like that, and that would be an intra-strand crosslink. So, basically, this mitomycin C molecule will produce both inter-strand crosslinks, where the two guanines are on opposing strands, and it will produce intra-strand crosslinks, where the two guanines are on the same strand. So let me just highlight these up. So this in pink, this will be an intra-strand crosslink. Oops. Okay, and this other one, in blue, this will be an inter-strand crosslink. Right, and we'll discuss the effects of these intra-strand crosslinks and inter-strand crosslinks in the, on the cell in the next video.